Knights, the Black Panther animated series based on the comic book series he wrote for four years. Please welcome Mr. Reginald Hudlin. Hey, Reggie. How you doing, Sean? Wait a minute. Why do you look so small? Wait a minute. I, you, there we go. There we there go. We there we go. go. There we go. <laughs> Uh, and How are you doing? Just, I'm great. And just to clarify, it wasn't that I did it because you kept harassing me. I wanted to do it. You're my dear friend. Of course, I wanted to do it. Glad to do it. it just, but you're right. Things are a little hectic. So this is my first window, but very happy to be yeah. here. Well, I want to tell everybody who's listening today. So I was texting Reggie. I said, Reggie, I want you to come on. I want to interview you. He's like, okay, I'm a little busy. I'm like, okay, but maybe you can squeeze like a little window in. He's like, I'm like really busy, but I will, I'll get to you. And I was like, okay. Then I watched the Emmys and I was like, whoa, he was really busy. <laughs> it was busy. Really there was no hype in that. I was, no one really understood it until they saw the show. They were like, how did you do that? I'm like, I'm telling you. Oh my gosh. Okay. So uh, take me back. It was announced that you were executive producing the Emmys back in July. So yeah. right smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. Were right. you apprehensive saying, oh, you know, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off because you, you know, this is, I mean, this was a big deal for you in your career. Were you hesitant at first about accepting the invitation? Not at all. Not at all. A uh, couple of reasons. One is by that point, I had done two specials during COVID. I did two mm -hmm. specials in June, one for YouTube and one for Turner. Okay. So I had already remotely produced two specials, one in nine days, one in five days. Wow. So I knew it could be done. Mm -hmm. Now the challenge was doing the Emmys, which is one of the absolute biggest award shows. Yes. Um, and the expectations were incredibly high. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a couple of things that really made me feel confident. One was I was partnering with a company called Dun and Dusted. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're an amazing company. And I knew me and my team team uh, working with the Dun & Dusted team would really figure out some good solutions. Yeah. Uh, the other is working with ABC, which is, a uh, I you know, I'm familiar with the executives at the network mm -hmm. and they were, they were down for the adventure mm -hmm. right? because really what you're talking about is reinventing award shows. Yes. Yes. And, as a person who does award shows, I do the NAACP Image Awards, so I've mm -hmm. done the Oscars, as you mentioned. I knew that it was time for that to happen. And we were going to use this crisis as an opportunity to experiment and try some new things. Yeah. So you, I, I read an interview that you did and you said that you were watching other award shows to see how they had done things virtually. And you were asked, do you plan to steal any ideas? And you said 1000%, that is how art works. Okay, since this is a business community that yes. is listening to this, this interview, I'd like to know what, like, what does that mean? Is you know art just one person's art is just an imitation of another's? No, imitation isn't the right word. And it actually, it, is, it isn't just art, it's everything, right? Uh, I think, I mean, I remember uh, talking to Chris Rock and Chris Rock seeing Martin Lawrence live at Radio City Music Hall. Uh -huh. And Chris Rock was blown away by how great Martin's act was. And he was like, oh man, I got to get it together. Because <laughs> this guy's killing it. And it yeah. inspired Chris to go on the road, to go to these little tiny clubs and elevate his game. Yeah. One of the reasons why Muhammad Ali is the greatest is because he had to fight Joe Frazier and Ron Lyle and George Foreman. I mean, all those are incredible opponents made Ali a better fighter. Mm -hmm. So in art, you're always, I mean, you know, I grew up watching movies by Kira Kurosawa, who's one of the greatest mm -hmm. filmmakers in the world. 
Now, when he was making movies in Japan in the 1950s, he wasn't thinking about me sitting in East St. Louis watching his movies, right? But I go, oh my God, look at what he's saying. Look at how he's doing it. So he's inspiring me. Now, I'm not imitating exactly what Akira Kurosawa did, but he's, he inspired me to elevate my game. Mm -hmm. I look at the Coen brothers. When I first saw Raising Arizona, I was like, mm -hmm. that's, uh, how can I make that kind of movie? Yeah. Now, I stole, straight up stole shots in House Party from Raising Arizona. Oh, you did? But when I point them out to people, because I had like, no, remember that scene when I run through that? They're like, I get that from that sequence. And they go, oh, you're right. That is kind of similar. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Right. People don't even see it because if you do it right, if you take that thing and you filter it through yourself uh -huh. and your flavor and your ideas, it comes out different. Yes. You yes. know, so I'm not literally just stealing but you take it and you go, okay, how, okay, that makes me want to elevate my game. I'm going to, I'm going to take the spirit of what they did, uh, but it doesn't look the same. Right, right, right. I, when I watched the Emmys, I was like, good Lord, that was such an undertaking. Now you watched the show afterwards. You were, you were critiquing yourself. Did mm -hmm. it go off exactly as planned or were there some things that you said, oh, gosh, I wish I would have done this a little bit differently or I really liked how that came off? No, I tell you, well, well it, it's funny because uh, it really is a collective effort. Uh, and watching it, I was really impressed with the show. I really have to yeah. say. <laughs> because, <laughs> because there was so much that could have gone completely wrong. I mean, completely wrong, not a little bit wrong, right? I mean, the fact that we never lost connection, even though we're talking to people literally all over the world. Listen, I lose connection when I'm talking to my mother in Detroit, okay? This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. Phones don't really work that good. Here we are connecting to people in Tel Aviv, in Berlin, you know, all over the world, and we've got great connections. We are coordinating teams of people in hazmat suits <laughs> delivering Emmys, right? Yeah. And they all work. They all were in the right place at the right time. We're like, oh my God. And the scariest thing was a couple of people got these gift boxes, uh -huh. right? And if you won, we trigger the button in Los Angeles. And in New York, it would shoot confetti and it would pop open and an Emmy would come out. And um, Jimmy Kimmel was sure that was not going to work. He was like, come on, come on, guys, come on. And we said, Jimmy, tell them, tell them, tell the people that it's not going to work. Let's let's just lower expectations. You're probably <laughs> right, but we're going to do it anyway. But you're probably right. And it did work. And we were like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you were really happy. So let's talk a little bit about your background, Reggie. You were born in Centerville, Illinois. Yes. I grew up in East St. Louis. What, yeah. what was your childhood like? How far back do you remember? I remember all the way back. I mean, I remember, I remember, uh, you know, you know that, you know, I guess, it's not really kindergarten, maybe it's pre-kindergarten, daycare, whatever it is. But I remember, okay. I, remember, I remember, okay, even before you go to that, right, before you go somewhere for a chunk yeah. of the day, there's that neighbor who takes care of all the neighborhood kids, yeah. Mrs. Wooten. Mrs. Wooten took care of everybody's kids. So every mom, because most of the moms worked, right? So uh, the moms dropped the kids off with Ms. Wooten. And you, she had a big backyard, so we played in the backyard. And we all had to take a nap, which we hated because we were not sleepy. But we would lay there and then finally we'd pass out. And if you were good, you got a white pot of donut, which was a big deal. I would say, I, yes. Uh, we got graham crackers, so go ahead. <laughs> that's upgrade. I mean, graham crackers good, but a white pot of donut, that's the kind of luxury. So, so I mean, you know, East St. Louis is a small 
all black town, uh, economically very poor, culturally very rich. I would not be who I am if I wasn't for me, St. Louis. It really made me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both your parents were teachers? Uh, yeah, well, they start off well, both as teachers. My father became an insurance agent. He had his own insurance agency. And my mother uh, specialized in special education, uh, hmm. both kids with learning disabilities and gifted kids. Mm -hmm. And she ended up running a mental health center and running a magic school program. So mom's this teacher uh, that works, you know, she has a great uh, uh you know, career as, as, as an educator, mm -hmm. how much pressure did that put on you and your brother Warrington, who is also mm -hmm. a friend of mine to mm -hmm. really excel in school? Yeah. But bo both my parents, I mean, uh, going to college was assumed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, no, 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 the, the, the weird thing is when, um, when Warrington was in high school, uh, there was this, they, would, they would sit around and they said, well, there's a Yale University summer school program for high school kids. And he applied and he got in and he went to summer school at Yale and then you know, they paid for it, whatever. They were trying to, you know, diversify, get kids from disadvantaged areas to consider going to the Ivy League. Mm -hmm. uh, so then he said, well, I'm going to apply to go to Yale. And my dad was like, oh, okay, I don't know who paying for that, but okay. <laughs> and he, he got into Yale and he got a scholarship and it was all good. Now, later I realized that my aunt and two of my uncles also went to Ivy League schools, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, you know, they went to Columbia, they went to Princeton. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why? Uh, like, why was it a? It 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 was a, an achievement that my brother went to Yale, I went to Harvard. But I realized it's actually part of a little kind of a family tradition. Yeah, you, know, you had people who preceded you who have yeah. set the standard for you, right. or or gave right. you an example of that this is something that's achievable. Yeah, but it wasn't like I didn't think of them as. Aunt Lucille, who went to Columbia, or Uncle Richard, who went to uh, Princeton, they were just Aunt Lucille and Uncle Richard. And quite frankly, everything about them was amazing. So I didn't even, we didn't even lock on where they went to college. They, it was just, you know, my Aunt Lucille was a dean of nursing mm -hmm. uh, at Southern Illinois University, which is the school where we, near where we lived. And uh, my Uncle Richard, um, you know, he worked for IBM for a while and he could he could literally build his own computers. That was before anybody knew how to work a computer. Right. So they were just amazing people uh, in, a, in a million different ways. My uncle Rich is the kind of person he would come over the house and go, I just went to the Japanese store and I bought seaweed. Let's all try seaweed. And you go. Okay, <laughs> you know, like now we eat sushi, so eating seaweed doesn't feel exotic. But well, back then, in 1971, eating seaweed is like crazy. But he was that dude who just didn't see limitations. Yes, and, no. and that that's the power is the, like no ceilings, no ceilings. You not only went to Harvard, you graduated magna cum laude. Yes. Yeah. Well, the thing was, when I got into Harvard, I knew I didn't want to go to graduate school. I didn't want to go to law school or business school or medical school. And I really worked hard my whole life. Great. Right? So I said, you yeah, know, now that I'm here, I'm going to try my best, but I'm not going to be a grade grubber. I'm not going to be one of those people obsessed with grades. I'm just going to be here. I'm going to learn and I'm not going to stress. So then at the end of it, four years later, they're like, oh, you're a magna. I'm like, wow, that's cool. Then I was like, hey, can I get a summa? Then I said, no, 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 no. I made the right choice. I just, I had a great four years. I had a great time. Uh, and that was the right call. But yes, I got, I, I, it's Magna. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's Magna. Okay. And it, it was at Harvard that you directed your thesis, okay, yes. which was a short film mm -hmm. called House Party. Yes. That was inspired by your experience growing up in East St. Louis. Yes. 
And and so how did you how did you I, I'm I want to know how that thesis became this classic in Hollywood cinema. Right. But how did you did you think at that time that this was going to be a big deal, or were you just putting together some of your experiences and trying to you know trying to graduate? Right. Well, again, Warren is my older brother. Uh, he was uh, he studied film at Yale and he was making independent films back before even independent films were a thing. You know, he was just yeah. a true pioneer, right? And I wanted to make movies too. He said, so he did two things for me that were really important. The first thing was, because whenever we talk on the phone, I would tell him my ideas. So finally one Christmas, he gave me a gift, I opened it, and it was a book. And all the pages in the book were blank. And he said, stop telling me your ideas and write them down. Mm -hmm. Now, truly, if people say, oh, Reggie, what advice do you have for people? It's the same thing. Write them down. Just write it down. And some people are like, I got a great idea for a movie. I need you to write it down. Well, you can write. And then, well, I don't know how to do it. Don't worry about that. Just just write it, write it down. Write it down. Mm -hmm. So write you it. started writing down your ideas in and that book. They weren't like a whole movie. Sometimes I just hear somebody say something funny and I write it down. Oh, I look at a situation and oh that's funny situation. So I just collected all these pieces and clips. So then when it was and so I'm studying film and Warrington said before you graduate make sure you have at least 10 minutes that's as good as anything. Mm -hmm. Right? That you could put up against anybody and be like right? So I knew, so I looked in my diary and I collected all those ideas and I put, so put them together and put a plot to it. Now, the Harvard Film Program was very documentary oriented. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I was going to make a scripted movie was actually a little bit of rebellion, mm -hmm. but I wanted to make what I wanted to make. Uh, and I was very much inspired by movies like Animal House and Risky Business. Mm -hmm. I just want to, you know, I was like, well, why can't we make a movie like that? Why can't we just express our teenage years and having fun and stuff? So I, I put together the movie. And for those who have seen the short film, it's not that different from the feature version. It's The ending's the same. The plot's the same. And so I shot my little short film and everybody really loved it. Um, and a few years after that, I'm graduated, we're out in the world, and Spike Lee makes She's Gotta Have It, which is like, boom, it's a revolutionary statement. And it really opens the door for black filmmakers, mm -hmm. uh, particularly us outside of Hollywood. And so a, a young executive at New Line Cinema saw my short film and said, hey, we want to talk to you about that. So I ended up writing a feature length version of my short, and they said, okay, let's make it. Boom. So Boom. all of a sudden, but this is what I'm saying. Remember I was saying before about oh, stealing from each other? Yeah. We also help each other, right? Yeah. Because, you know, one success can open the door for other people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes failure closes the door for us too, but <laughs> success opens the door. So that success, uh, she's got to have it open the door for House Party to get made. So um, House Party mm -hmm. um, was one of, according to Variety, uh, one of the most profitable films of the decade. Yes. Um, did you guys negotiate a good deal? Did you, did you get rich off of it? We did. <laughs> we did, for real. You, you were able to negotiate a good deal. It was, it was again, an amazing thing. Nelson George, who you also know, um, um, who's the hub of all things, right? And Nelson said, well, I just met this lawyer in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, so I, I, I met the lawyer and we kind of talked for a couple of hours. I said, well, if I ever need a lawyer, I guess I'll call this guy. And the next week I got the call from New Line offering the deal. And uh, the lawyer, Stephen Barnes, was really aggressive. We had a really aggressive deal. And, you know, we, we didn't get a lot of money up front, but it didn't matter. I mean, I would have did it, you know, like you just make it a yeah. movie. That's right. but we had a really great back end deal. And um, the movie um, 
The movie cost two and a half million dollars to make. I remember the opening night, the Friday night, we all went out with the studio. One of the studio execs had a little too much to drink. And he said, Reg, we're in profits. I go, what do you mean? And he said, well, the movie, we sold it to Showtime for $2 million. And then we sold it to a home video company for $2 million. So that's $4 million. And then we're going to make $4.5 million this weekend. So we pay for the movie, the marketing, everything. We're already in profits Friday night. So we got the statement and the movie that cost two and a half made $27 million, right? So we made 10 times our money back. And they said we hadn't broken even yet. Uh, and then, you know, we did some negotiating and we got our money. Yeah. <laughs> so... What because that's a lot of that's information they don't always want you to know, right? That's correct. <laughs> that's correct. But you were able to find that out. Okay. Yeah. Now you and your brother, let me just go back a little bit. You and your brother uh Warren can formed a video production company. You did music videos yeah. in the eighties and worked with some, you know, stars that we know today, some legends that we know today. Yep. Well, it was really interesting because uh, I was showing some of my early student films at the Newark Film Festival. And this guy was there who was like, hey, I like those movies. And so that's how I met Andre Harrell. Mm -hmm. And Andre was there and he said, we're going to make music. He's going to make movies together. We're going to do this. I'm like, okay, I hear you talking. But, you know, wait, you look, you're a, you got a record company. Well, how about some music videos? So I figured, well, that was real. I mean, I didn't know about all this other big talk he was saying, right. but I knew we'd get some music videos. So we did a deal to make two videos for $50,000, which to us was a king's ransom. Wow, $50,000, that's a lot of money. So uh, we did Heavy D and the Boys' first video, uh, Mr. Big Stuff, and we <laughs> did this video, Uptown's Kicking It, which featured all the different uh, acts uh, side to Uptown. But it just started a lifelong friendship with Andre Harrell, mm -hmm. uh, who was just truly one of the all-time greats. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, Heavy D and, uh, you know, so many of those. I mean, you know, Chill, of Groovy Chill. I mean, it, it was really uh, and a wonderful experience uh, that I always treasure. I mean, when I look back at those early days, making those music videos, doing House Party, that's like... We, let's like graduate from high school with somebody, right. you know, like yes. you started out together. Um, like I was just talking with, you know, kid and Tisha and some of the folks uh, in the last couple of weeks. And it's like, we have a lifelong bond from that experience. Uh, right. And no matter what, whenever we talk, the same when you have a high school reunion, you just go right back to the yes. old days. It doesn't, yeah, we, we got kids, da, da, da. But, we're still back to that moment. Yeah, and you know, I went to school with AJ. Oh my God. There you go. There you go, Spelman girl, Spelman girl. Yeah, that's, and that's the thing. And, it's like, and we have a love for each other, you right. know, that collective bond, which is forever. Love AJ, yeah. the best. Um, now, two years after you did House Party, you directed Boomerang yes. in 1992, another movie that would go on to become a Hollywood classic. Tell me about first reading that script. Yes. Well, it was pretty amazing because House Party came out and we got a call from Eddie Murphy. And it was like, <laughs> you know, and it was crazy because Eddie Murphy was a giant, giant star. And later I realized that Eddie and I were the same age, but that didn't seem possible because he was on Saturday Night Live and I had a bedtime. So <laughs> It was just like, ow, how are we any kind of peer? It just didn't make sense. Anyway, Eddie saw House Party and loved it. He said, man, you you guys go for the joke. I like that you go for the joke. So we have been talking for a year. He would pitch me ideas. I'd pitch him ideas. And finally, he sent the script for Boomerang. And the script wasn't there, but the premise of doing a black romantic comedy I was like, yes, this is what people want to see. Because for me, it's not so much, well, here's the black movies that, that have been made. What haven't we made? Where can we go where we haven't done before? 
I mean, if you look at my whole career, I don't repeat myself. You know, every movie I make is different than the one before. Mm-hmm. So I just want to try new things. I want to want to make different kinds of movies. And also for us, I don't want to represent every part of who we are as black people. Mm-hmm. So the idea of doing a, a big romantic comedy with Eddie seemed like a great idea. He hadn't made that kind of movie. I hadn't made that movie. Uh, and we hadn't, we didn't have that movie to look at. And so we agreed. We we and I also think about Eddie. I never felt he had a cast worthy of him. Mm. You know where he was surrounded by all the killers in comedy. I mean, he had worked with some good cast, but I wanted like the the baddest. You know, and so we had Chris Rock, Martin Lawrence, David Lannan Greer. You know, uh, uh, Robin Gibbons. There was this great new actress that I thought really was going to have a big future named Halle Berry. You know, like, you know, putting that group together, most of whom were not very well known at the time. I mean, people were like, really? You want the, you don't, really? You want the, yes, these are the people I want. I believe in this cast. I mean, there was a lot of challenges uh, to the people I cast, but I was absolutely certain. So you, uh, I mean, your your career, Reggie, is just so extraordinary. You've done, you know, movies, television, but you also, in 2005, became an executive. You yes. were the president of entertainment at mm-hmm. BET. What were the skill sets that you, you know, needed for that job that were different from yes. being, you know, this independent producer director? Yeah, I had never been an executive before, um, but. Someone called me out of the blue, right? I'm literally in the towel, just got the shower, phone rings. And it was a corporate headhunter. And they're like, we're looking for the first president of entertainment to be of BET. They want to move to a new era. They want to do original programming. And either would you do it or would you, you know, recommend somebody? I was like, hmm, you mean run the biggest black media company on the planet. Yeah, I'll do that. (laughs) That seemed like a good idea because I knew for me to really understand show business, I'd have to understand every part of the job. Yes, I've been a writer or producer or director. I worked in film, I worked in television, but being an executive is a different skill set. And I hadn't done it before, but I hadn't made a movie before. I hadn't done a lot of things. I mean, you know, I, I, sometimes I say ignorance is a key part of success. Mm. I mean, I look at the Wright brothers, right? They built the first plane that flew. All the scientists of the time said you couldn't do it. But these guys who had a bicycle shop figured it out because they didn't know no better. So, and if you talk to most successful people in any field, I mean, at Harvard, there was this course you could take as an undergraduate at Harvard Business School. And they would have all these titans of industry come in. And every one of those guys, when they told their story, they all had the same part in their story. If I knew what I was doing, I would have never done it. They always go to a point where it's like, They tried something that was way too much, way overly ambitious. And anyone who would have known better would never try it, but they didn't know better. So they did it and it worked out great for them. So that's kind of my attitude about trying things and taking risks. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, I had never been an executive and I thought, well, it's probably like being a producer. No, it's like being an executive. (laughs) Like, but having made, having been a producer and director helped enormously because people couldn't tell me what couldn't be done. So I can do that in six days. I have, Mm -hmm. what's wrong? Right. So you could say that. And at this end, I had relationship with the creative community and People were like, oh, BT. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm here. I'm your inside man. Trust me. Mm -hmm. You know, give me your dream. What's the project you, so the studios don't understand? Let us do it. You know, let us be the solution. 
because that dream project is probably your best idea. And BET should be the place where you can do your dream project. So, you know, we had mm -hmm. enormous amount of rating success. We broke my first year, we broke the ratings record three times. And, um, you know, mm. we, you know, highest rated show. Oh, now this is a new highest rated show. Then after that, uh, the news division has shut down. We rebuilt the news division. Uh, in a year, we won like 14 awards for BT News. We built a home video division. They, they didn't have that. And we were building a movie division uh, by the time I left. So, you know, we, we did a lot of things and had a lot of success. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, now you earned an Academy Award uh, for Best Picture. Academy Award nomination for Best Picture. Mm -hmm. You produced Django Unchained. Yes. Which to me, I, I'm telling I remember going to see that on Christmas Day. Yes. And I Christmas said, Day. oh my gosh, he really went in on this one. Mm -hmm. Really went in on it. Tell me about the experience of uh, doing Django Unchained. It was it was a great great experience. I many years ago, and we kind of instantly clicked. And because he loves movies, I love movies. Uh, he grew up in a black neighborhood, going to see black exploitation movies, same as me. <laughs> you know, uh, so we had all this stuff in common, right? And. When he would have a rough cut of a movie, he would invite me to go see it or he had a new script. He would have me read it and give comments and stuff. So we just had a really great relationship. And I was a giant, giant fan of his work. Uh, your, so, your audio dipped when you were saying the name. You're saying Quentin Tarantino. This is Quentin yeah, Tarantino. Quentin, you know, that yeah, he Quentin and Tarantino. I had this long uh, relationship and I was a big fan and we just really liked uh -huh. each other. And, you know, he would ask my opinion about whatever he was doing, you know, Oh, look at the rough cut of my new movie or read this new, new draft of a script. And I was always uh, proud and flattered to do it. It's a big deal. If a filmmaker asks you to look at his movie, I mean, right. that's, that's a big deal. Yes. Um, so I appreciated that he, valued my opinion and would entrusted me uh um you know to do that so it was really lovely mm -hmm. and an academy award nomination uh along with it very yeah, nice you know, i mean you know he just um he he gave me the script for django and i read it and i loved it and he said well this is because of you and i'm like what are you talking about and he re reminded me of some conversation we had had 10 years before talking about slave movies. And I said, for me, there's only one great slave movie, uh, Spartacus. Um, that in The Legend of Nigga Charlie with Fred Williamson. Um, and I don't know if you remember The Legend of Nigga Charlie. With I, I, no, I, I don't, I don't. Uh, it was great. I actually, okay. I saw it when I was a kid. I actually don't remember the movie. I just remember how I felt when I left the movie because for 90 minutes, Fred the Hammer Williamson whooped ass. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's my kind of slave movie. I didn't see, want to see ass whooping for the entire length of the time. So, so okay, so you're not a huge fan of many of the more recent slave movies you've seen? Well, look, I'm not, I'm not here to pick. Look, it's, look, I think it's not one size fits all. Right. Mm -hmm. People need different messages and different ideas. Right. So you got to. So it's not like, well, this is the, the definitive this or that. It's like, so I'm just saying what I want. Mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, that's it's like, look, it's a buffet. Life is a buffet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, if I don't want the jello, but you want the jello, I'm not judging you for eating the jello. That's good. That's all good for you. If you want the ham and I want the turkey, that's all good. <laughs> all right. So for me, uh, when, when, when I hear people say, well, I don't like slave movies. I'm like, me neither, but I like freedom movies. <laughs> you know, I, I, if, if there's a movie about black people fighting and succeeding and showing how, how you can't hold us down and how we break our chains and how we uh, overcome our obstacles and actually do better than the people who are trying to oppress us. Yes, I want to see that movie all day. <laughs> Give me more of those. 
Okay. I got you. Um, you, um, you directed Chadwick Boseman yes. in the legal thriller um, uh, Marshall. Uh, what can you tell us about working with him and his work ethic? He, uh, you know, he's such an extraordinary person. Uh, it, I mean, it was wonderful. From the first minute we met, it was wonderful. He's a total intellectual. He's so black. He's South Carolina black, <laughs> the, you know, and Howard educated. I mean, that, that one, two punch is powerful. It's powerful. And his commitment to art is 1000%. So he was such a fantastic partner. And, you know, from when I approached him about playing the role, he was like, oh man, doing another historical figure. I don't know, Reggie. He had done, what, 42 already, he had right? Done 42. He had done James Brown. Mm -hmm. um, so I understood it. I understood his situation. He didn't want to be the biopic guy necessarily. So I said, well, do you like the script? Oh, I love the script. Well, you know, and he goes, well, yeah, and Reggie, you know, I love you. I can't wait for us to make a movie together. I said, yeah, I feel the same way. I said, well, do you think a Thurgood Marshall movie should get made? Oh, absolutely, of course. He's, he's such an important person in black history. I said, well, if you say yes, then the movie gets made. And if you say no, it doesn't. You go, wow, Reg, why you got to go there with it? I'm like, what's the truth? I'm just telling you the truth. So for the greater good, he said yes. And we made a movie uh, that I would have never believed you could get a movie about Thurgood Marshall made. And, you know, because of him, because of Josh Gad, because of Kate Hudson, uh, uh, because uh, of Sterling K. Brown, we made a movie that's become a classic that people, I mean, people still discover it. You know, when when Chadwick passed, people started watching all his movies and they're like, hey, you know, I got a whole new set of phone calls. Reggie, I'm in my feelings right now watching <laughs> Marshall. You know, people are really toe up. Uh, because the movie, uh, it, it's not just a movie about a great man. It's a, like you say, it's a thriller. You know, it really uh, hits people in their feels. And, and that was the goal. Right, right. Um, you did the Black Panther comic series, right? Yes. Animated yeah. series. Yeah, I did, I did the comic book for about four years. And when I was at BET, uh, someone said, well, why don't you make an animated series out of a comic book? I said, oh, that's a good idea. So we did an uh, animated miniseries based on the first six issues of my comic book run, uh, which also became successful. And I think the combination of the comic book and the animated series really helped set up the billion dollar success of the movie. Yeah. And Shuri, uh, who's Black Panther's little sister, I created. She didn't exist before in the comic. Really? Book. So I'm um, very proud of her because, oh my gosh, she was so wonderful in the movie. Ryan and Letitia, they really nailed exactly the intent of who she was supposed to be. So I was at the premiere with my son feeling really proud. I bet. I bet. I bet. What memories? What memories, Reggie? Now, you had made, as we mentioned earlier, uh, history being the first African-American to produce the Emmys. Um, you know, in, in spite of your accomplishments, do you still feel as though you have to prove yourself in ways that your non-Black counterparts do not? Yes, I know that is a factor, right? That um, even though things have gotten better, you know, in the in, from the time I started my career to now, um, there's still, yes, we're still running on the beach with weights on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I feel very confident in who I am, that I've achieved enough that even though I'm still looking for doing new things that I've never done before, constantly looking to challenge myself, Right. Mm -hmm. Because to me, when you have that little bit of fear in your stomach, that's when you deliver your A game. Right. you got to know you can fail. You can fail big. Right. Mm -hmm. and that's, 
Sir, get up early. Let's go. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but that said, I, I overcome that enough times that I know I can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and you know, obviously to get movies done, you need people to, to green light them. Yes. Um, how much power do black people have in Hollywood? And how do you, you know, how do you rate that power? Right. Well, I mean, technically speaking, we have very little power. You know, there are no studio heads. Uh, there's no black person who can green light a movie or a TV show. Um, you know. None. No, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I don't, not that I know. I mean, there may be. The fact that we're struggling right now to come up with a name, that's the. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. I'm like, there's some people like, well, can they bring on a TV show? I mean, you know, there may be someone at a streamer or something that may yeah. be able to do something because uh, those structures are a little more opaque. So you can't mm -hmm. always see how the decision making process it is. But at the traditional studios uh, for motion, so we can say, we green light that, that's going to move forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, there are stars uh, for whom if they agree to do a project, that project will likely get made. Mm -hmm. So um, so we have star power, um, but, uh, you know, but, and, and you know, obviously Tyler Perry is a force unto himself, right? Um, so... Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Tyler Perry. If he says I'm going to do this show, someone's going to buy that show and do it. If he decides I'm going to make a movie, that movie will get made. So he's a, in a unique situation. And obviously, Oprah Winfrey, if she decides she wants to do, I mean, I I would love to talk to Oprah and go. Anyone ever say no to you? Anyone in this century ever say no to you? I don't, I don't think that's the case either. So there, there are people like that who have extraordinary uh, clout, which is earned from you know an incredible track record of success in both cases of Oprah and Tyler. Um, but is it business as usual? Do we have our own institutions or are we high enough placed in mainstream institutions? No, we're not there yet. Uh, you know, do I see incremental improvement of our situation? Yes, I do. Um, you know, I know black people sometimes don't want to acknowledge that things are getting better. They go, but we still, I yeah, no, things are still bad, but we are getting a little better, <laughs> a little better. <laughs> um, but yeah, we still have a ways to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you are, uh, before I want to, before I ask you about what, what, what's next and what else are you going to add to your already, you know, extensive uh, resume, um, you are friends, you and your wife, Chrisette, who's also a friend of mine, uh, yes. are friends with Kamala Harris. Yes. Senator Kamala Harris, yes. um, you know, if, so if one goes to your your social media, they see that you are a a strong supporter of hers. Absolutely. Tell me about your friendship with her and what people uh, who may not know her well, um, what would you like them to know? Well, you know, it, I, I met her under ideal circumstances because, you know, when you, you, know, you, you get involved with someone, you get married to someone, you know, you inherit each other's friends, right? <laughs> and those friends can be a, a blessing or, or not so much of a blessing. Uh, but uh, when I'm, uh, fortunately, my wife has really good taste in friends. And yes. uh, I, they're all great. And Kamala was really impressive. But I met her just as my wife's friend. And, you know, we'd hang out and she was funny. She was smart. She was political. I was just like, wow, she's really jamming. Um, and then when she decided to run for DA of San Francisco, uh, we were like, oh, let's go support her on the kickoff. So we went at the start of her campaign and she gave a speech. It was the first time I heard her. So do you see your friend at work for the first time? And you're like, oh, 
you're the truth. I did, wait, I have to reassess. You're just my friend, but now I see you in context of what you do. And I mean, look, I had that Obama feeling of just like, right, I'm down with you. I'm ride or die with you. And, you know, through her different campaigns for DA to attorney general to Senate, um, uh, she's just that perfect combination of someone who um, is really smart, really knows how to get things done, not just, you know, pie in the sky, but actually accomplishes things that helps people. Uh, and she really cares about people. Um, and <clears throat> I guess there's so many, I mean, I, yes, I feel bad that more people don't know what I know about her. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's the, you know, godmother of my daughter. And, and she, you know, and she's so loving to my son and daughter. And she's, she'll come over the house and then she'll disappear. And I'm like, where is she? But she's in my daughter's room and she's giving her tips on debate because my daughter does debate, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, or she'll be in the living room teaching my son how to play chess. I mean, she's that person who, it doesn't matter what she's doing. She takes time mm -hmm. to be with somebody, you know, like I was talking to another friend of mine and she was at some very fancy event, but she wasn't feeling well. And Kamala realized she wasn't feeling well and went over and ignored everybody else and sat and talked with her for a half hour. Because she says, I know you're not feeling well. I don't want you to feel weird. So we're just going to sit here and talk so you don't feel out of place. And she could have been talking to all the power brokers in the room, but she talked to her friend who wasn't feeling good. You know, and she did that all day, you know. Um, and so when people go, is she really black? I'm like, she's, from, she's, she's so black. <laughs> you know, like you have no idea. <laughs> if I mean, I don't believe in blacker than thou contests, but she wins all of them. Blacker than thou. Uh, but also she's just so, she's such a caring person. And when I say, okay, well, who do you want in government looking out for people? I want someone who's smart and someone who cares. And she's both those things times a hundred. So I, 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 we'd be really blessed to have her, uh, we're blessed to have her in, in the positions of power that she is. And we just need her to just keep going, taking on more responsibility because she's willing to do it. Because quite yeah. frankly, those jobs are terrible. I mean, Lord have mercy. <laughs> are you working with government? People calling you? I got a hole in my street. I don't never want no phone calls. <laughs> Anyone willing to do that, bless them. Yes, I uh, I met uh, I met Kamala through Chrisette, your wife. Um, gosh, over it has to be like I don't know, twelve years ago, ten years ago, something. Uh, and just impressed with her from the very beginning, and just uh, just a, a wonderful woman. Okay, so I am going to take before I let Reggie go because I promised him I would not keep him long. We're going to take a couple questions. So post your question, uh, and while you're posting that. Um, I, you know, it, Reggie, if you were a lot of people are tuning in today because you're, you know, you're so brilliant and, you know, people on this platform look for advice on, mm -hmm. you know, starting their career, especially now that we're in um, this pandemic. You know, it was interesting when I left uh, Access Hollywood after 16 years and mm -hmm. you know, started producing mm -hmm. and just kind of doing my passion projects. Mm -hmm. uh, people were asking me, gosh, I wish I could, you know, go out on my own. I wish I could do my own thing. I wish I could do something I'm really, really passionate about. And of course, we're in a, you know, unusual time. People are just happy to have a job now. But, you know, if you were just starting out, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a filmmaker, producer, director, um, and your your advice really is universal, even for people who don't you know, uh, mm -hmm. are, aren't in those fields, mm -hmm. but you know, how, what would you do? Like, uh, how would you, you know, what, what would you do if you're, you're first, you're starting off or making a career change and deciding right. to do something different? Well, the, the main thing I always tell people is there's so much information available, right? More mm -hmm. than ever. Like <laughs> if you have one of these, right, you have a supercomputer. Right. Mm -hmm. This is more powerful than what they had when they man went to the moon. Right. right. 
So you can sit there on your phone and learn everything about whatever subject you want to do. If you want to study film, if you can't afford film school, you can study international cinema on your phone. If you want to learn about uh, heating and, ref and, 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 and refrigeration, you can study that on your phone. And what always freaks me out is people, it's like, have you, have you done as much as you can do on your own to learn everything about what it is you want to do? Because that's what I did. Like, you know how we all read Variety and Hollywood Reporter? I'm from the Midwest, so I don't, so I just picked up and started reading the trades. And when you first start reading the trades, it's like Greek, right? Yeah. And I said, I'm gonna read this every day until it makes sense to me. And I just read and read and read. And finally I could kind of follow it and I knew the names and kind of knew what they were talking about. And I would go see movies movies from all over the world, old movies, new movies, every kind of movie. Just do your homework. Just knowing a bunch of random ass information <laughs> will take you further than you could ever imagine. Right, right. Okay, so here is a, let's see, Sean, my question is, have you have you not made the ideal film film that is still stuck in your brain computer? So right. what, what, what basically, what have you, what yeah. have you dream? What do you want to do? What's in that notebook that you still have to make? I really, there's, there's two categories of movies I'm dying to make right now. I'm working on them. I want to make a, a, a superhero movie really bad. And I want to make a musical really bad. Really? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I've got all kinds of projects I'm working on, but those, uh, those two are, the two things I'm determined to do uh, in the next couple of years. Where can we see the short film version of House Party? Does it still? I, I'm sorry, Dwayne. I, I, I don't get it up anywhere. You said what? I, I got a copy in my closet somewhere. <laughs> I know I should get it digitized and put it up. I, I will. I just haven't got around to it. Yet. You just but have I not got around to it yet. Yeah. Not got around to it yet. Okay, so you want to make the you want to make the the musical, um, and what about you, you know you have this production company. You and Warrington have this production company. Obviously, mm -hmm. people are like, I want to pitch you this movie. I want to pitch you this script. I want what you know. Can somebody just submit a script to you? Can that you they know? <laughs> they know. I mean, when they see you uh, at a restaurant somewhere, do they just walk up to you and say, Hey, Reggie, I've got this great idea. And here's what happens. <clears throat> they go, I got an idea. No one's ever heard an idea like this. It's two cops, one black and one white, and they don't get along. I go, uh, no, I'm sorry, not interested. And then they go, you stole my idea about the two cops, one black and one white, and they don't get along. You go, dude, first of all, that's the most common idea in the world. It's not unique. Uh, and no, I didn't steal it from you. I mean, <laughs> it's just, so for me, I can't take scripts because I can't put my, I can't risk the legal exposure yeah. of that conversation. So no, no unsolicited material can be pitched Correct. to you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So like, does it have to come through an agent or yes. do you, okay. have your agent send it to me? And then they go, well, I don't have an agent. I go, I know. <laughs> that's the that's the tough part of the game. This is, it's tough. It's not yeah. fair, but it is what it is. I mean, I just I have to protect myself. Yeah, so I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, uh, but but that's I, that's it, that it, people really don't understand because you do have to have representation to protect everybody, and right. there has to be right. um, you know a, a system that is, you know, gets it from one hand to the other. So nobody is accusing anyone of stealing. Right, and, and here's the thing, honestly, I've been on both sides of it. I mm -hmm. felt like someone has stolen an idea of mine. Really? People accuse me of stealing their idea. And because what happens, you think your idea, sometimes the ideas really do seem unique, but yeah. it's freakish how many times that unique idea will pop in different people's heads at the same time. Because you realize your unique ideas really aren't that unique. And certain times if there is a moment for a certain thing to happen, other people are feeling that moment. Like when right. I was trying to get my Thurgood Marshall movie made, 
there were two other Thurgood Marshall movies in the works at the same time. Really? Like, How the hell? All of a sudden, everybody trying to do Thurgood Marshall's life. It seemed like it was impossible, and now I'm in a race. Right. The other ones, but you know what I'm saying? Like, and we didn't bite each other. We were both in, all inspired by a great person. Yes. So I, 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 you know, I've, I've been on every side of it enough to know, be safe. Right. Okay. Uh, and speaking of uh, safe, how are you dealing with uh, the pandemic? Are you and the family just kind of quarantining or, or, you know, staying locked down in the house? Are you venturing out? We, uh, we stayed pretty much on lockdown. Uh, I just got tested this morning. I like getting tested. I like, <laughs> I mean, I don't like getting the back <laughs> of my brain scraped by the little thing. <laughs> like, ah! But that said, I like knowing I'm safe, you mm -hmm. know, but look, I just stay at home. I'm good. I mean, that's kind of my job anyway. So much of it stay at home. Right. So I stay at home. I do my work. Uh, I, I love being home with my family every night. I try. Mm -hmm. to, my thing is be in the lemonade business. Okay, <laughs> this is a bad time. How can you turn the lemons into lemonade? How can mm -hmm. you make something good out of it? So I'm just working as hard as I can, spending quality time with my with my family, uh, and you know, planning for when I can get back out in the world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that movies are going to change in the future? Are they already changing where we're not like could a Black Panther obviously could not be, you know, filmed today because of all of the people. Do you think we'll see a different kind of movie going forward in the near future with fewer cast members? Look, we want big movies. We need big movies right now. We're all hungering to see Big movies on a big screen, uh, but we just have to get a cure. I mean, health first. We yeah. gotta get a cure. We gotta. Um, we have to get all of America to do the right thing. Wear masks, social distance, wash your nasty ass hands, <laughs> so we can break this curve. <laughs> right now, right. there's more people infected in the White House than there are of all of Vietnam. That's how backwards we are. The White House is sicker than the whole country of Vietnam. And Vietnam is ahead of us. That's, we, we, oh, we, we America, we number one. We behind like a mug. <laughs> we is, like us, uh, uh, Russia and Brazil are the raggedy ass end of the, uh, of the nation. It's embarrassing. We have to get our acts together as a country. Please, everybody, fill out your census and vote. I hate to end with a, <laughs> with, a, with a PSA, but really, I know you're scared of filling out the census because you're like, they don't need to know that. They don't know everything about you. You got a phone. They got all your business on the phone. So just fill out the damn census so we can get better representation and vote. Because if, if you don't think your vote counts, then how come they're working so hard to make sure you don't vote? Amen. And Amen. Every rich person and every powerful person I know votes. The only people who go, man, voting don't make no difference are some broke ass, get nothing done people. So which crowd are you? Are you the rich, powerful person or a person who wants to be rich and powerful? Or you want to be a person who sits on the stoop all day talking about how the man is against me? Reginald Hudlin, I love you because you never hold back. I am so glad. <laughs> you. I am so glad uh, that we had this opportunity. Uh, that we all had this opportunity to hear from you. Um, you're you're great. I love you dearly, and I am very proud to be your friend. And thank you for making time. And uh, even though I was like blowing up your phone right before this like international <laughs> feat that you are about to pull off. I appreciate Sean, you making time. Sean, you're the best. I love you. This was so much fun, which I knew it would be. Always love talking to you. You're fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, I probably said too much on this thing. But see, it's you. See, this is you. I'm just like, I'm just talking. I forget. <laughs>
a million people watching you, but you're having fun. So bless you, love right. you, and thanks thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Tell Chris said, send her my love, please. Absolutely. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Wasn't he great, everybody? Wasn't he great, fam? I just love, love, love me some Reginald Hudland. So I hope you learned a lot. He is so full of wisdom. Um, okay, you know, well, let's see. What I took away from that conversation when he was talking at the beginning of our, of our, um, you know, our, of our conversation when he was saying, look for, look at people for inspiration. Um, and, you know, you might have an idea, but, you know, somebody's going to help you elevate your game. And so research, do everything you can to research your field, especially when you when you want to start out, um, you know, make a career change or if you're starting out for the first time, you know, make sure you uh, do your research. That phone, he said, the phone is going to be your greatest source of information. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been great, inspired me, and uh, I hope you all have a great day. Bye.